Hey everybody, good to see you back again. So today we'll press both of the steering clutch packs onto the bevel shaft. We'll get rid of the rest of this hardware and a few other minor pieces along the side there that are going to be put onto the transmission today as well. So I have my little 17 and a half ton hollow ram out here, all the usual suspects for installing press fits. And yesterday on the members page, we milled out this custom D2 steer clutch pressing sleeve as always a link is down there below you can go click on that see if you want to join up with your fellow team squatch cohorts we do have fun over there adventures misadventures sin debauchery and our new slogan is no shirt no shoes no problems so step number one is to make sure all of the taper splines are clean and dry you don't want to have any oil any rust any dirt any grease nothing on those areas right there once you've ticked all of those boxes, start to clutch on the splines. So before we set any of this stuff up, one very important detail on the sleeve adapter we've made, this pocket that we milled in the top of it must be in register with that little dowel, that little peg right there on the hub. That thing has to go up inside that if it's all going to live. Okay, set up to press. A couple of talking points though. First, why are we so far out with this sleeve? It looks like it could be a lot shorter than it is. That's because I made this to be dual purpose. It not only works on the steering clutch pack, but it will also work on the steering clutch drum. They have the exact same spline taper press fit. So when you're using this with the drum, you're gonna have to be working down, way down in the bottom of that thing. You're basically down in a hole, so you need the extra reach so i built that into it so we can you know accomplish all tasks with the one setup second talking point is how tight do we press these hubs onto that shaft so here's our caterpillar spec chart taper press fit pressure in tons and all surfaces to be clean and dry so we go down the steering clutch column reference it over to d2 and it recommends a 15 ton press fit on these hubs problem is and this comes from the man mr edb himself this guy has more years of real world experience dealer shop experience working on these era of tractors than anybody else i know and if eddie b says it that's how it is he says at 15 tons press fit you run about a 50 50 chance of splitting these hubs right in half they run up that taper and they can't handle it and pop you're done so they eventually started maxing out at 10 tons press fit here that's the maximum level and they could handle it every time personally i even like to be down around the maybe seven to eight ton range i've i've put them on at that before before i had all this nice stuff i've never had any come loose so i think we're probably going to shoot to around eight ton on here i feel pretty good at that so let's proceed we just watch the gauge There's five. Here, I need both hands for this. <laughs> We're about seven. That's eight. Tell you what, we're feeling dangerous today. That's nine. I'm calling that good. Nine tons, nothing has exploded yet. Having a look in here, yep, we have a good fit because the hub is still standing out proud of the end of the shaft. So that's what you wanna see. We can secure it with the bolt. And we aligned the cutout in the flat washer with that little dowel that's in there, so that's good. We can torque that bolt now. So I've put my, uh, my squatch holding fixture back on this other side to keep that bevel shaft from turning. 
and I'm going 220 pound feet. That's pretty well in line with a three quarter by 16 grade five bolt. So that's what we will do. Our press fit is what installed that onto the shaft. So this bolt just retains it. There we are. All right, so I think what I'm gonna do on this side is complete the setup before we move on to that other side. And you'll see the method of my madness here shortly. So we have the bolts that go through the release yoke and into the bearing cage where the release bearing is. The solid one goes on the front here and then the one with the passage drilled in it goes on the back. Both of those are gonna get a liberal coating of grease on the threads on the peg all over the place. Okay, just finishing up. Bolts are tight and we have the fold over lock down there and in there. Same for this side, folded it on the front and on the back. So we finish off with the oil catch cup. Now this is a whole new level of fold over lock etiquette with this. You can see you take the top of that one and you just bend it around where the thing necks down right there. So, and then when you get the bolt tight, you can figure out where you need to fold it up against the bolt. So that goes on the back right back there. And the bolt is tight, lock is folded, and you can see that catch cup just follows the yoke. So we're lined in beneath the oil line from the cap up here. So this side is good. The only thing we have not done yet is performed all the necessary adjustments up in here. You can see I still have everything well short of actuating the clutch and it's going to stay that way until I get a final drive on because yeah we could we could set up all the tolerances and get the steering clutch lever positioned and everything but if somebody comes along like me <laughs> forgets and grabs on this lever or bumps it and takes the tension off of that clutch pack all these frictions would drop and then I'd be grumpy. So until the final drives are on we're just gonna have free floating levers. That's just kind of something that makes life easier. But I did set up what is basically the skeleton of a steering clutch over here to explain how this mechanism works. I still get a few questions on this. And again, to explain the, uh, the reason why we have a metal steel disc on the inside up against that pressure plate. So the hub is a press fit on the bevel shaft and the friction discs can rotate on it, but they are splined to the drum on the outside. The steel discs, however, are splined to the hub and rotate along with it, as is the pressure plate. Remember, the pressure plate has these spring pins going through it, and these pins also pass through holes in the hub. So that means the pressure plate and the hub both rotate at the same time. And since the steel discs are splined to the hub, the steel rotates along with the pressure plate. So that's why we can get away with having a steel disc right up against this pressure plate because you don't have any metal on metal rubbing action that happens. They just follow each other. And when the pressure plate releases off the clutch pack, the steel floats away a little bit. And then when it engages again, it just mates up to it. And there's not any actual metal on metal wear. So that's why hopefully that explains uh, once and for all why we can end with a steel disc on that clutch pack. So when the steering clutch lever is pulled, it rotates the front of that actuator right there forward. And when the front of that actuator rotates forward, you can see the foot on it back here rotates inboard toward the center line of the tractor. And that carries the release yoke with it, pushing the release yoke in towards the center line. And you can see how this yoke attaches to the back pressure plate via that release bearing cage. When the yoke drifts into the center line, what it does is pulls the pressure plate in and takes it off of that clutch pack. It further compresses the springs out here, but since the hub is splined to the bevel shaft, this hub doesn't move. So all you're doing is taking that pressure plate and pulling the tension off of the clutch pack. And that's where your frictions can then rotate independent of the steels that are splined to the hub. So power flow comes from the bevel shaft into the hub. It is then carried into the steel discs and the steel discs via the spring tension transmit that power to the frictions and the frictions drive the drum that powers the final drives. And unless you release the clutch, pull that inner pressure plate off, the frictions can spin independent of the steels and you have a disengaged clutch. 
And hopefully this also helps to illustrate why the adjustment on these steering clutches is counterintuitive. It works opposite of the way your brain would think. So remember, the hub doesn't move. It's fixed to the bevel shaft, but as that clutch pack wears thinner and thinner, the pressure plate is going to drift outward further. And when it drifts outward, it takes that release yoke with it and pulls that outward. So to maintain your lever travel, you need to keep backing this adjuster bolt further and further out of that yoke as it wears. So that's why when you get into these things and your little square drive head is right up against where the pinch bolt is on that yoke, that means you've got a nice thick clutch pack. If you see a lot of thread sticking out on the inside, that means that that pressure plate and yoke has already drifted out because the pack got thinner and you're nearing the end of its lifespan. You can see on this one over here, we have this brand new three inch thick clutch pack and I'm only about 50% on the adjuster bolt and that's because I have it so that nothing is even contacting the mechanism in here. So when I rotate this clutch lever forward to pretty much its normal position, you can see I've got a good three quarters of an inch in there before this adjuster bolt comes up against that foot. So I'm pretty much gonna run out of threads by the time I get my lever travel and free play all set. So yeah, we'll be right down probably getting to where it's difficult to get on that square drive. That means we have a new clutch. Hopefully this all makes sense. That's the easiest way I can explain it. Okay, everybody, let's put the other side together. All the same steps as before. See that? We clamp the back end of the pump down to the bench. <laughs> we learn. It's a slow process, but we do learn. About six, seven, eight and a half, nine. Calling her good. Okay, please don't judge, but some of the time it works most of the time. Just be ready to uh, brace yourself in the event of a fall, all right? There we go. Okay, solid plug on the front. This is the more difficult of the two to work in. This side wasn't too bad. Usually when I turn the camera on, it just, <laughs> nothing works, right? This one fell right in. And now the back one, you usually have to slide the lock in without it on the bolt because otherwise it won't fit. Here we go. Suppose my hands are in the way. Oh well, it's kind of tight quarters in here. Another tip, pre-bend that inner tab on the lock. That's gonna make your life a lot easier. Here we go. And finally the brass catch cup. These are just things of beauty in my world. I don't know, it's, oh, it's a shame. Shame we have to bury them so deep in the machine. I just love those. Little details like this. And once again, bolt tight, lock folded, and yeah, we've got a good assembly right there. Again, we're right underneath that oil line. So, take a minute to look. That whole bench of parts that used to be out right here is all contained right here and right here. So I told you that stuff would condense down without a whole lot of trouble. So all we're left with are some of these miscellaneous pieces along the side. And this is some pretty straightforward stuff. So we've got this little cover here, goes on the back, gasket for it, bolts, and then this, uh, this large rectangular cover that caps off that steering clutch adjustment area. Made a new gasket for that. I prefer 
this heavier cork for those because that's something that is going to have to be taken off somewhat regularly. So there's our square cover and before I put that on, I want to take a minute to talk about a really good question came up in the comment section under the last video. This is all going to tie together, trust me, but someone asked what this plug is sealing right there as well as the corresponding plug in the same area on the other side. Well, right from the start of D2 production, CAT made what was called a tail seat option for these tractors, meaning instead of the operator seat being up here, they relocated it further back and farther down to basically decrease the overall profile of the machine for doing like orchard work, getting under branches, limbs, things like that. And as part of that tail seat modification, they also had to relocate all of the controls further back to now still be within easy reach of the operator. So this plug seals a bore on this side as well as this one on the other side. And that's where the steering levers would pivot and enter the case on a tail seat model right there and right there. So they had a differing actuator on the inside then because we have our actuators are in these front two holes, but you see you have a duplicate set of holes there and there. It was a slightly different designed actuator and what they did was just flipped it so that the steering levers would pull on it from this direction, but you'd still get the same inward motion on the, uh, the foot pad that contacted the release yokes. So, Another part of that, they relocated the shifter from up here to this spot right here. That's the spot that we're going to cover with this plate. You see these two cutouts on each side. You remember the cross pin that's in the base of that shift lever? That's what allows that cross pin to, to float side to side right there and right there. That's the same bolt pattern. I believe they did use a slightly different shifter housing that also incorporated like the throttle pivot came down off of it and then the brakes also pivoted out here. It was quite an interesting setup. Oh, and then the last part of that shifter mod, the shift rails that are beneath this, basically just continued back on through the bevel gear compartment. They were really, really long, and they deadheaded back here, so that's where your shifter would in, uh, interlock with the pockets, and you'd still have the same, you know, transmission gear layout arrangement, but your, your shift levers were, you know, <laughs> or your shift rails were like three feet long, so. That was actually a very good question, and I just wanted to take this, uh, this short little bit of time to explain some of the duplicate features on this case that are not used in this application, but it just goes to show back in the day, they were thinking of everything. So I'm just gonna put the small cover on and leave the bolts only finger tight at this stage because I'm probably gonna wanna have access back into that bevel compartment. It'll make sense maybe in the next episode. But yeah, on the topic of these steering clutches sticking and these bimetallics, um, I mentioned also in the prior video, these are guaranteed not to rust, not to swell, not to stick. And a guy had an interesting comment he put in the video. He had a 2H series D6 or like my RD6 that he said he had trouble with these. It had the bimetallic discs in it, but it had so many oil leaks into the steering clutch compartment that they became completely oil soaked. and they caused that caused so much viscous drag between the frictions and the steels in other words they didn't even want to pivot or slide against one another that oil film had been pretty much stuck fast he said he couldn't steer that thing he had to take it apart and actually pry those discs apart with a pry bar because the surfaces were so flat and so matched and that oil film just stuck them together so we'll get the rectangular cover put on over the steering clutch adjusters Again, these bolts be left loose because we don't uh, we don't have any uh, anything properly adjusted yet in there. But anyway, I bring that up because it leads to another comment that I had under the last video. Someone was wondering if I couldn't just fill these steering clutch compartments with oil and turn this into a wet clutch now that it's the bimetallics. And going back to the prior guy's experience with them exhibiting excessive amounts of viscous drag in that 2HD6, I would say that's a pretty short no, you know. I mean, and it was a good idea thinking about maybe turning these into oil-filled compartments to address the condensation buildup problem. I would also bet that having oil in the steering clutch compartments on this D2 would also affect the performance of the brake band that goes around that clutch drum since it would all, it would be in oil as well. So yeah, whether it's rust or whether it's oil, you'd kind of just create the same problem with it being difficult or impossible to steer. So all good questions, all good uh, topics for discussion here. That's kind of why I like the, the comment section, some interesting 
debate comes up from time to time. And unfortunately, really your only option, especially with these D2s is to, well, keep the compartments dry, but also keep the machine exercised, keep it always, you know, all limbered up because, you know, you have this top compartment, this cover you could take off. And there are also plugs down in the bottom of these final drive compartments you can take out to drain off like excess oil from time to time from these caps, you know, moisture, what have you. But the problem is if you store them with the cover off and the plugs out of the bottom, yeah, you can get some more airflow through there and they don't build condensation as bad, but then usually rodents decide that this looks like a really good place to build a nest. And, and then you have, you're back to the same problems anyway. So yeah, unfortunately the only real bet is to just keep these things limbered up and uh, drive them or move them regularly. Keep all this stuff from sticking on you. And the last cover on the bench is for the main clutch access point. And you can see we got the oil cup on the top, copper tube goes down. That delivers oil down to that main clutch release yoke. Threw some new felt in the cup. Here's the old felt booger that was in there. Dug it out, it's quite nasty. So yeah, the felt I used, uh, I'm, I had to replenish my supply the other day. So again, I get this from the McMaster Car Company. This is a sheet of F1. It's a pretty dense felt known as a wicking felt they use it a lot for like i know oil retention like on ways of uh, milling machines and lathes and stuff like that i'm going to see what the pass pass through capability is of this so we're going to throw some oil in on top of that and we're going to see how long it takes for it to get down to the bottom of the tube And drip, stop. Two minutes 55 between drips. Honestly, I think the felt is doing its job. Liking it. You definitely want to pre-soak any felt you put in a cup because if you just put one in dry, threw some oil in it and went to work, it's gonna take some time to absorb through and then start running down. That's to uh, give you slow delivery out the end of that line. So we'll just monitor this and make sure that this F1 grade is gonna be good for this application. If it's not, I'll let you guys know. Fairly simple install here. Again, heavy cork gasket is what I prefer under these because this cover is, does get taken off from time to time. Darn thing still wants to uh, stay curled up. It's been so long in the roll, you know. And once again, no need to fully tighten those because we're gonna be back in doing further adjustments later on and the copper tube lines up well with the catch pan on that clutch yoke bracket so we're good there now final thing we're going to put on today is this main clutch lever linkage we're not doing a lever because i've mentioned before 1113s has suffered some damage the whole end is bent and broken off and i am still on the fence as to whether or not i'm going to fix it or try and replace it here i'll show you what i got the only two other clutch levers I have on the place are, well, neither one is pristine. This is the one off the Beer Can 3J, and it's bent, and the handle's been welded. And here's the one off of 2115. It's pretty straight for the most part, but again, the handle's been welded, and there's been some repairs there. And I am I may just repair 1113s yet. I like how the, uh, the hole in the bottom of it for this... Uh, this ball stud is still pretty good. Those other two have been running loose over there and it's kind of flogged. And so we're gonna cross that bridge probably next time. But in the meantime, we can at least get the linkage put on. Also was gonna mention about all we did here was just shoot some long life grease into those ball studs. The fit is still really good. And you can see the end caps are still staked in from the factory. These have never been apart and I don't really have a reason to take them apart. So we're just gonna go with those as they are. There we are. Lines up well with where the clutch lever is going to pivot down on that end. Looks good. Well, everybody, I think we've got a pretty decent power transmission unit here. Happy with the clutches. They're all new. I'm happy with the gear train. I'm satisfied I've made that as good as I could. 
with today's current parts availability. So minus that main clutch lever, we're pretty much a complete unit here. The steering levers are gonna look better once we do all those adjustments and they go more toward their normal position, but yeah, we're keeping them slack so I can't go bopping by and bump something and, and drop a bunch of frictions, like I said, so. And at this point, we would normally pop that cover on the back, seal that case up and move on to the finals, but you know, I wanna try and put that PTO on here and since this is the attachment point, I think we're just gonna roll right on into power takeoff mode continue that power flow the rest of the way back. So yeah, we're gonna cut the video right here for the day. I can tell we're getting a lot of files on the camera again. So yeah, before we haul finals in, I think I'm gonna go crack into that PTO and see what we're gonna have to do to get that, you know, resealed, refurbed. I don't, I think it's gonna be in good shape. It seems like it is, but you never know until you get into them, right? Plus I like taking things apart. So as always, everybody, thanks for watching. Please tune in again.